Hi, everybody. This is Tom Shade, The Lively Tradition, and here is another interview with one of our UUA candidates for presidency of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, who is the lead minister, senior minister at the UU Church in Phoenix. So hi, Susan. How are you? I'm doing well, Tom. It's nice to see you. Oh, good. I'm, it's always good to be seen. Uh, I, I know you've been busy with a lot of campaign uh, through, uh, campaign appearances at this point, uh, forums in different regions, so I appreciate the fact that you're willing to take time to talk to me. And I just wanted to say, today I wanted to talk a little bit about, well, here's my first question. You know, um, as this Trump administration starts to govern, uh, how do you think, how do you think about what Unitarian Universalists should be doing? What should we be doing as a body of faith? And what should the staff of the UUA be doing in this period of time? What's, the, uh, what's your vision of what a local congregation is like in these days? This truly is a defining moment. Mm -hmm a moment of challenge where we are experiencing an onslaught of attack against the health and lives of women, of people of color, of communities of color, of immigrants for our planet. Mm -hmm. This is a time when Unitarian Universalists are being called to be a vital voice for love and for justice, for our values in this defining moment. And I am a leader who has been shaped by defining moments and bringing forth a vision of love and an organized response for justice in times like these. I wanna tell you a little bit about my story. So I started my internship ministry in Nashville, Tennessee, in Nashville, Tennessee, a diverse religious area, many immigrants from Iraq here in Nashville. And I started on August 18th, 2001. On September 10th, 2001, the lead minister here uh, left for Louisiana to visit family. Mm -hmm. So on September 11th, three weeks into my internship ministry, I was the minister for the congregation. As you'll recall, all flights were grounded, so the mm -hmm. minister couldn't return. So mm -hmm. that night, the next night, I led meditation prayer services for our congregation and the wider community. I didn't know what to do at that moment, you know, when it happened, and I showed up and created space for wholeness and healing, and it, it was at that moment that I feel my ministry began. Mm -hmm. When I got to Phoenix, Arizona, Paradise Valley, I struggled being called there at first. I thought, what am I doing in this uh, suburban, wealthy area in ministry? I'd been doing urban ministry in Youngstown, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I definitely felt called to Phoenix, but I, was, I just wasn't sure how my gifts were gonna be used there. And then SB 1070 was passed. And in that moment, I knew why I was in Phoenix. When I called in the midst of the, of, you know, to SB 1070 essentially made the unconstitutional and human rights violations of Sheriff Joe Arpaio state law and through copycat legislation, a national issue. And I called on Unitarian Universalists to come join the movement of resistance in Arizona. And UUs came. Over two years, thousands and thousands and thousands of Unitarian Universalists came to Arizona to support that movement. We showed up like no other faith community because that's who we are. We are a people of faith and our faith is grounded in love and we are called to justice because we know that love is what, that justice is what love looks like in public. And then we had the whole question about whether or not to boycott Phoenix as the site of General Assembly given SB 1070. In that moment, we were in conflict as an association about how to respond faithfully out of our counter-oppressive, anti-racist values, out of our values of love and justice. And in that moment, what 
what, what I did and was a part of doing with other leaders was stay, staying at the table, listening to each other and forging a way forward for us to come to Phoenix in accountable relationship with leaders of color in our movement, uh, with marginalized communities in our movement, and then with the grassroots leaders in Phoenix. My ministry has been forged in the fires of defining and challenging moments. And right now, more than ever, we are facing a crisis and a challenge that's national, that's global, and we need leaders and we need congregations prepared to show up, unlock the power of our moral voice, our religious presence for love and justice in this time. That's why I hope I'll have the support of Unitarian Universalists to be the president for this time. So, so what you're describing is um, a ministry that, you know, was uh, called upon because of particular circumstances in, in Phoenix. Um, and, uh, and so your congregation, which we've talked about this before, your congregation already had a history in immigration work. And, and you were at a point there where... Um, not only could you move forward based out of your in you know out of the congregational witness but also you were in a position that you were able to call upon the rest of the unitarian universalist community around the country to come and support you but most of our congregations are not at that point they're not in that historic moment and so is uh is your sense of what a local congregation should be doing is uh waiting for the call, uh, how, how does the local congregation that's not having history thrust upon it, uh, what's your vision of what, what that's doing? Uh, you know, that goes down to everything, including, you know, how are people handling the Trump supporters in their, in their congregation? So my vision for Unitarian Universalism hangs on three things. Number one, spiritual vitality and health in our congregations. Number two, being grounded in relationships and collaboration, both within and beyond our association, and then being organized for impact. So what people may not know about Phoenix is before I got there, the congregation had been, had had a long history of conflict. They'd had a church split, They'd had anxiety and distrust around ministry and leadership. They were often bogged down in conflicts among themselves. Mm -hmm. And a few key leaders said, what happens, what would happen if our congregation just disappeared? Would anyone notice? Would it make any difference? Mm -hmm. And out of the challenge of that question, they created a strategic plan with a clear vision to become a beloved community. What that meant was strengthening the health and quality of covenant within the congregation, as well as effectiveness and mission beyond the congregation. Without that foundation of health, without the work that they had already done to move past silos of power and internal power structures, struggles, we would not have been able to be as effective or prepared to call on the association to mm -hmm. join us. That, those kinds of actions, getting arrested out on the streets, those could have split a congregation. We didn't have unanimity. Mm -hmm. But we did have unanimity that we were one congregation with one mission. And there was enough leadership behind the work to combat Sheriff Joe Arpaio and SB 1070 that, that the community held together and didn't try to pull the work apart, but trusted the leadership to lead. So I think that lesson is important for all of our congregations. Many of our congregations may find themselves on the front lines of homelessness, mm -hmm. of transgender issues, of global climate change. Mm -hmm. And the health of the congregation is where our best justice comes from, the spiritual foundation of our covenant and living the values of love is our doctrine in our congregations. When we have that kind of unity around common mission, we are far more effective in the wider world. 
And I want to share a story about a small congregation in Terre Haute, Indiana. Mm -hmm. So I was traveling through Indiana and um, I saw the UU congregation of Terre Haute and I pulled in. It was a Friday and there was a lay leader there. And I asked for a tour of the congregation and I asked him, what are you most proud of about what's happening in your congregation? Now, this is, this is a small church. They don't have a minister. And he said, we have built a relationship with the mosque in Terre Haute. Mm -hmm. and we monthly community dinners and we've been doing this for a while now for several months and the UCC the United Church of Christ wants to join and be a part of this mm -hmm. um, table this these mm -hmm. dinners so there in Terre Haute Indiana that congregation is living the values of love and justice in a red state in a conservative place reaching out to Muslim neighbors to say we are people of faith you are a people of faith we want to we we want to be in faithful partnership and relationship with you. We're glad that we are in this community together. Mm -hmm. We're glad for the diversity of our community. So I think, you know, it does happen in yeah. big places. And so small it's, places. it's the spiritual, when you say spiritual health and vitality, you mean uh, strengthening the covenant and the commitment to the kind of covenant that churches have, love is the doctrine of church. I mean, People have lots of different ones, but they have pretty much the same intent. Uh, strengthening that within the congregation so that they can uh, both reach out in partnership and be able to respond to events in, in uh, their community and in the world in a way that uh, keeps them together and moves them forward rather than dividing them. Is that, am I hearing you right? Yes, that's a part of it. It's also, it has many levels. So, mm. you know, we, we don't do power so well as mm. Unitarian Universalists. Uh, we don't, we're, we're nervous about power, distrustful of power. There's legitimate reason for that mm -hmm. history. And we need to name that and be accountable around that. Mm -hmm. But we have power structures at the UUA and often in our congregations that are not transparent and that are not clear and make it hard for leaders to really lead. And in these moments of challenge and crisis, it really is leadership that is needed. Mm -hmm. And when we have structures that make us like social clubs rather than like prophetic mission focused religious mm -hmm. communities, and, and we it disempower our ministers, our board leadership, then we are not effective in living our mission in the world. And so in these challenging times, I think we need to put mission first and say, how are we gonna be effective? And how are we gonna support leadership that's transparent and accountable? There needs to be accountability around leadership, but we need to authorize and empower and support leaderships, leadership that's trying to unlock the power and our values mm -hmm. for our communities and our world in this defining time. What oh, you must be thinking about specific situations that uh, you would be in as a leader of our uh, association, and what what sort of situations come to mind as being the ones that uh, are the most uh, that you think would be the most typical, or the ones that are the most exciting to you? Uh, what kind of situation? You know, I mean. Uh, is it speaking before 10,000 people at the base of the Washington, at the base of the Lincoln Memorial or, or, or what, you know, I mean, that's kind of the, kind of the, yeah. uh, the super big leagues of a particular style of leadership. But uh, so, you know, what do you think that leadership is going to be like? What do you imagine your, uh, yourself in? Surely before you go to bed at night, you're thinking about what am I getting into and imagining scenarios. I love our faith, our Unitarian Universalist tradition. I first started to think about running for president at the end of Justice GA. And mm -hmm. when I agreed to work for the UUA in uh, making Justice GA uh, powerful, impactful, and accountable, mm -hmm. I remember saying to a friend, I know I have the heart for this but I'm not sure I have the stomach for the politics of institutional leadership and institutional work. And I actually found that I did not only have the stomach, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think one of the things I think about being president is that we really need to move our association into a place of greater health and professionalism and strength. 
And we need to do that collaboratively. We need to be in relationship as we move forward so that we're keeping, so that we're, um, our vision is crafted out of accountable conversation and relationship, but also that we keep people in the boat and moving forward together. Mm -hmm. So I think about how we bring, um, how we make sure that the UUA president and leadership isn't myopic and only seen inside the UUA, but is in deep relationship with our congregations, deep relationship with our identity-based ministries, as well as um, even beyond the UUA, how that vision is informing and pulling us forward. And I think about times in that work of Justice GA, and there was a lot of conflict and difficulty at the highest levels of the association in that time. And, and that hasn't been unusual for us, some, you know, in moments about um, being present, being deeply grounded in relationship and listening, and then keeping us focused on the vision that we've set for ourselves. The key question about how are we going to be most effective in amplifying and unleashing our values for this time. So I know I'm, I am known for my justice work. I realize mm -hmm. that, but I bring a lot of knowledge of our institution and how to move an institution forward and keep it focused on vision as well as bringing more and more voices into the work. So what I hear you saying is that the work that you envision is often the work at the highest levels of council where uh, um, decisions are being made and differences are being surfaced and maintaining uh, presence and focus is being what you imagine the uh, most important parts of the UUA presidency are. That's an interesting, interesting um, perspective. Well, let me say this about the role of the president. I think uh -huh. there are three roles and uh -huh. one of them is the prophetic and pastoral and national voice for our faith. Mm -hmm. And the other is um, the CEO, which is establishing and modeling a leadership culture mm -hmm. for the association. And the third is the chief fundraiser, ensuring mm -hmm. that we have the resources we need for the mission that we're being called to, that we have the funds we need to for the mission to our congregations, that they so are getting the resources they I mean, need. Let's go there. So imagine that I am a wealthy donor. Yeah. I like to pretend that sometimes myself. A wealthy donor who has come to you and said, you know, I could, I, I have been supporting the UUA for years, but I am so discouraged by how political everything is becoming, how it's politics, politics, politics. I can't tell whether we're the Democratic Party or uh, a religion anymore. What's happening and why should I keep giving you money when I could just, uh, you know, when I could give my political money someplace else. Why you and not, you know, why you? At, at this point, well, I mean, there's two questions there. One is why you and not indivisible. And the other is why you when you become so political. And I'm more concerned about the second. What would you tell me? So I would, anytime I meet with a donor, uh -huh. I try to ask, what is your dream mm -hmm. for our faith? And what is resonating for you about our faith? So that, you know, our conversation is deeply rooted in, um, in, in the dreams of our association, not the challenges of the present moment, but where we are going and where we need to go. Mm -hmm. The challenges that we face right now are not, this is not a political crisis. This is not an economic crisis. This is fundamentally a moral crisis crisis. What we are experiencing in our country is a failure and a, and a denial of the capacity for compassion within humanity. As Unitarian Universalists, we are a critical, we have a critical role to play in this time in bringing forth a moral vision, in bringing forth um, the power of compassion this is not about political parties. This is about our capacity to love one another as human beings, to have compassion for the experiences of people all over our country and all over our planet. And so I would say that Unitarian Universalism is one of the most important places that we need to be building our health and strength for this time. 
because we're not going to get through this crisis just by negotiating the best deal. We're, we need to actually be living the power of love in our hearts, in our lives. We need communities that are teaching us to resist fear and the way that closes off our hearts to one another, resist nationalism and the way that that closes off our country to the global planet. We've never been more connected across the globe than ever before. And yet in the midst of this time, we see this nationalist movement. This is a heart problem that we're experiencing. And so what we need to invest in is where are we gonna build our courageous, compassionate, loving hearts for this time? Okay, oh, let me get my checkbook. Uh <laughs> Thank you. Make it out right to the UUA. <laughs> Let me ask you another question from another person. Uh, and, uh, uh, I heard this from uh, one of our colleagues uh, a while back who said, uh, geez, they, you know, most of my work is, uh, is Sunday morning. And if I, you know, I just look sometimes, I think if I can keep the doors open and the orders of service printed and a, and a successful, meaning non-disastrous Sunday morning service. That's enough, I can hardly get that done. What, why all, the, I, you know, this, uh, the UUA asks for so much more than what the local congregation can give one most of the time. We're just struggling to get the, keep the coffee pot on. Uh, what do you say to that minister about, um, about, uh, about what needs to be done now. So again, relationship. What I would love to see the UUA doing, and one commitment I have is to ensure that the leadership of every congregation has a meaningful conversation with someone from the UUA at least once a year. Hmm. Because what the UUA does what we're offering, what we ask for, needs to be informed by our congregations and our leaderships. We, and our leadership. We need to understand the realities on the ground because that is where our faith is being lived out Sunday after Sunday, week after week. And so the thinking at the UUA, what we ask for needs to be informed by the congregation. So we need to strengthen our relationships as a UUA with the local congregations and religious communities across our faith. It may be that we need, that we're asking for too much, that we're moving in too many different directions. You know, when you, strategic planning is all about being really clear about where our voice can make a difference, where our resources can make a difference. So we do have a structure at the UUA uh, uh, that, you know, has general assembly creating asks of congregations and the UUA board setting ends that create asks out of the president and the administration. So we move in 50 different directions and that's not a sustainable way. It's not a um, effective way to lead. So I think the UUA needs to be mission and vision focused to have a clear and compelling vision and um, to be so focused on that and using all of the resources of our association aimed in one vision so that we are not asking 50 different asks of our congregations, mm. but one or two, mm -hmm. right? And then context matters. So some congregations will answer those one or two asks and then provide more than that for the association or for the other local congregations in the area. And some congregations may say, we can do one of those two asks. Mm -hmm. but do that so we have to be we have to be really strategically focused in what kinds of asks move us forward and move our vision and our values forward and and grow the health and strength of our faith one of the things i'm most proud of about justice ga mm -hmm. is that we were um we were stepping beyond our comfort zone mm -hmm. we were leaving behind business as usual to make a difference but Justice GA not only made a difference on the ground in Phoenix, Arizona, and in the lives of immigrants in Arizona, it also made a difference in us as Unitarian Universalists. 
people continue to say it was one of their most powerful experiences of Unitarian Universalism and the most powerful GA. So it not only made a difference in the ground, it made a difference in people's hearts about their commitment, their, um, their, be, their ability to see who our faith can be. It was, so it was also institutionally positive as well as being justice positive. And that's the strategic place where we need to keep leading and working. And, you know, I want folks to know that even as I am so committed to our justice work, that it comes out of my lifelong Unitarian Universalism, of my deep love of our faith and who I feel we are called to be, but that the institutional health is deeply important to me because that, that is what supports and um, creates the capacity for us to live our mission effectively in the world and in our local communities. One last question. And, yeah. Um, most of us nowadays are pretty uh, practiced and uh, trying to be aware of how our life circumstances that we've grown up in and um, our privilege, and often cases our privilege, mm -hmm. hampers or inhibits or shrinks <coughs> our um, perspective on social justice. Uh, we're, we're aware of our privilege as how it gives us blinders on social justice. So we're aware of kind of what unmotivates us or demotivates us toward the struggle. I, I want to ask you, um, what is it out of your personal experience in your life history that makes you want to struggle for social justice? What is your, what's your motivating experiences? Who are you when you get out there? So I, I'm formed by my name, uh -huh. Susan Elizabeth, after Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I'm formed by my mom, my mother, who was part of the ERA movement and became a feminist in the middle of her life um, and went to law school and achieved, you know, created a different way of being a, a woman and being married, um, that I'm formed by that, by seeing her. <laughs> I, you know, my first job at 13 was as a little league umpire. Mm -hmm. I love baseball, I'm a huge Cardinal fan, St. Louis Cardinals. Um, and for several years, I was an umpire and one of the only women umpires. Mm -hmm. And I was forged by the leadership that that took, especially, it was not about the kids, but managing mm -hmm. the adult coaches <laughs> and their behaviors. So leadership has been a part of my life since uh -huh. the beginning. And I guess I was trained to be a leader, I was trained to question history, to question who was erased from history, and um, to fight for the rights and a liber uh, the liberation of all people. And that's deep in my DNA. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Susan Anthony is my fifth, first cousin, five generations removed. It's in my DNA, it's in my story. It's in my formation. And it was there in my formation as a Unitarian Universalist. The commitment to love, mm -hmm. that our mm -hmm. faith is a faith of love, and that justice is what love looks like in public. Well, thank you. That, I think, gives us a little bit more uh, view into who you are, um, as well as what you think and uh, how you intend to act. So uh, that concludes that's well all that I have. So thanks very much, Susan, for uh, taking time to talk to me. And um, for everyone else, uh, let me just tell you that a uh, little bit of editing, and I'll be putting these uh, three interviews out on my blog uh, with links to YouTube so that you can uh, see them uh, side by side. Um, I have asked pretty much the same questions to each of the candidates though I've tried to keep the conversation live and, uh, and uh, with its own uh, liveliness to it.
Uh, so thank you, Susan, and uh, looking forward to uh, good luck with the election. I'm looking forward to GA, and uh, I'm sure you are too, bringing all of this to a conclusion, <laughs> at least this stage. Who knows? It may be getting even more interesting and complex after that. Thank you very much, and thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Good to be with you.